Good evening, my friends. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Coffee and Chat. This is our Wednesday night uh, online gathering for uh, Owensboro First Church of the Nazarene. So glad that you're able to tune in and join us tonight. Um, we're going to be uh, looking at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So if you've got your Bible, you may want to uh, open that up and take a look at that. Um, there was a um, there was a Peanuts cartoon in which Linus tells his kind and loving sister Lucy that he is going to be a doctor. She responded, "You a doctor? How can you be a doctor? You don't love mankind." Linus replied, "I do too love mankind. It's people that I can't stand." And I think many of us are tempted. As we get started tonight, I think many of us are tempted to love that way, to kind of love in the abstract, because it's much less costly to love that way. The problem is that love is not an abstract concept, but it's a living reality. So what is love? Well, Paul gives us an amazing description in 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, in four very short verses, Paul gives us an amazing look at love. In these four verses, Paul lists 15 virtues of love, describing what love is as well as what love is not. He tells us in verse 4, Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Well, tonight, we're only going to look at verses 4 and 5 from this passage. Love is patient. You know, the word used for patience is made up of two Greek words, meaning long and passion or anger or rage. And when combined, it literally means long-tempered, or that the temper is a long time uh, in, in rising. The word means um, waiting a long time before you give in to the anger. It's the, it's the quality of self-restraint in the face of being provoked so that we don't act before we think. It's the quality of having um, a long fuse. As we all know, that's not, um, that's not easy to do. We can jump to conclusions. We can be offended. We can make rash decisions. We can become angry, and we can slam some, something which breaks or even causes us some physical pain. It's not easy to be patient when we're being hurt. It's one of the acts of love that I'm still learning. Um, and be honest with you, I believe I'll be learning all of my life. So Paul calls us to be long-tempered, long-sufferers, to have a long fuse. Paul continues uh, telling us not only is love patient, but love is also kind. Love sees people's imperfections and yet still cares. Love is not unkindly in its criticisms or disagreeable in its actions. As I was preparing for tonight, I was convicted again and again, I guess, of my shortcomings. Am I always patient? Am I always kind? I mean, um, you know, I should probably stop there. But we've, we've heard these verses many times before. But when we slow down to really consider the meaning in our lives, well, friends, they're not easy. The word kind means useful, gracious, kind. It, it comes from the word to use. This is meant to be an active form of love. It's, it's a call for you and I to make ourselves useful. In, in a sense, it is a victory over idle selfishness and uh, comfortable self-pleasure. Have you ever noticed how much of Christ's life was spent doing kindness? He spent so much time and energy simply helping people. That's a great demonstration of love, which we can also do for our Heavenly Father. Be kind to His children. Everyone needs kindness. You do and I do. 
This verb is also a, a call to serve others. Paul starts with a, uh, with a passive love in being patient, which is slow to act and moves to active love, doing good for others. One of the things that I've learned about my life is that when we love, I mean, we, we must love our, you know, our, our grandmother, our cranky neighbor, an insensitive boss, a troublesome child, or even someone who's mean-spirited. If we keep love in the abstract, then we insulate ourselves from its sacrifices and actions. And so I want to ask you tonight, what about you? Is your love, the way you demonstrate love, is it in the abstract or is it in the concrete? At the same time, love must have boundaries so that, that we don't get hurt and we must be able to protect ourselves because people will act like wolves in sheep's clothing. At times, it's easy to be, to be deceived, but we must stay true to God and seek to follow God's call. Paul follows up patience and kindness with eight negatives. He tells us what love is not. And these things, they, they stifle us. They hold us back. And in a very real sense, these are the enemies of love. The first four deal with the abuse of the gift of love. Love is not envious. The word to envy literally means to bubble over because you're so hot, to be, to be boiling, to, to set one's heart on something, to be completely intent. The word is used to express any wrong feeling when viewing the good of others. Envy or jealousy is a feeling of ill will or begrudging uh, because of the supposed advantages of others. Envy goes further than jealousy. Because when we envy, we begin to plot and plan a way to get what the other person has. Love is not in competition with others. When you attempt a good work, there will be others doing it better. Do not be envious, but be grateful for them. I mean, because of envy, uh, Cain's envy of Abel's acceptance or acceptable worship hatched the murderer of his own brother. I mean, Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery because of en envy. Uh, Daniel was thrown into the lion's den because of the envy of his fellow officials in Babylon. I mean, real love does not resent the blessings or successes or the well-being of another. Paul goes on to tell us that love does not boast. Now, boasting is defined as bragging. To, to brag means that you're seeking vain glory, that you're you're a show-off who needs too much attention. Now, in Greek literature, it was used for someone who was a talkative, uh, self-asserting, or self-exaggerating person who put on a show to get attention. It's a person who lets everyone know what they've accomplished. It's the parent who can't stop uh, talking about their kids' accomplishments. It's great to praise your kids, but people don't have to hear it in every conversation. Boasting usually pulls people away from you. Now, they may tolerate you, but more than anything, they don't want to be with you because the side hazard of being a boaster is that you're only interested in yourself and you're not interested in the other person. It's when you tell them you, you, you took an amazing vacation, but they have to tell you about their better vacation. Or you tell them about your upcoming surgery and they have to warn you up by telling you about their bigger and better surgery. And love is an arrogant. The word arrogant comes from the word that means puffed up, swelled up, like an egotistical person spewing out puffed up thoughts. It just means you're full of yourself. And boasting represented an, an outward display, and arrogant is, a, is an inward character or attitude. It, it speaks of conceit and self-satisfaction. The arrogant person boasts or toots their own horn and sees others as inferior. And to contrast that, another person is modest and humble. And in a sense, they are modest because they are humble. They are the people who don't mind being last in line, who don't need to puff themselves up because they know God loves them. They are they're really secure in themselves. Puffed up people have an exaggerated opinion of their own importance. 
They often assume their happiness and their well-being, their opinions and feelings are the only things that really count. Puffed up people find it easy to to dismiss the needs and feelings of others. The first place that we might look to see if we have a puffed up sense of our own importance is in our prayers. Do we pray only for ourselves and our own interests, or do we also pray for others? In our everyday lives, do we consider others as more important than ourselves, or are our interests always first? If we're wrong, then we need to admit it. It's it's true in all of our relationships. Moving to verse 5, where Paul tells us that love is not rude. Now, on the surface, the definition is not about rudeness. The Greek definition is someone who who uh, acts improperly. They act unseemly. They behave unbecomingly or even dishonorably, indecent. It means someone's behavior is unabidable. They don't have the conduct which creates the desire for others to remain. We can easily be rude to one another. Now, we've all been there. We've all done it. We've all experienced Sometimes it's really difficult to know the boundaries of what is rude and what's not rude. I don't know one pastor who's not been on the receiving end of quote-unquote righteous anger masked as rudeness and arrogance. It's just a part of the landscape of ministry. It's really a look at how we treat one another. Are our actions unbecoming and indecent? And honestly, Sometimes it's just hard to know. Sometimes when we are feeling attacked, uh, we respond. We may think we've acted reasonably, but reasonably is very subjective. How one person views our actions is different from another person's. The bottom line is to have a goal to treat others with those first two words that Paul used. Patience and kindness. Now, of course, this doesn't mean you need to be in a relationship with someone if they have hurt you. We need to set up healthy boundaries so that we don't get hurt. We need need to, uh, to move away from those who hurt us, whether it's intentionally or unintentionally. Love, controlled behavior, does nothing which brings shame on you. Paul then tells us, love does not insist on its own way. There's a tombstone in the courtyard at St. Paul's Cathedral in London, which reads, Sacred is the memory of General Charles George Gordon, who at all times and everywhere gave his strength to the weak, his substance to the poor, his sympathy to the suffering, and his heart to God. I don't think he insisted on having things his own way. Paul is talking about someone who wants to further their advantage over you. They insist on having their way, not because it's best for everyone, but because it's best for them. And when this is done, it is manipulative. So the person can have what they want. It's the person who seems nice to you until you don't give them what you want, and then you realize the friendship was not real. I think we've all experienced that one degree or another. You see, the the love is not selfish. The love is not manipulative. It's it's not used to get get to uh, to get one's way. In agape love, there is no I'll love you if. That's just not there. Paul then tells us love is not irritable or provoked. This means that love is not exasperated. It's not irritated. It's not aroused to resentment. To incite someone and stimulate their emotions, to rouse someone to to anger and provoke feelings. And I wonder, how often do we irritate others? Oftentimes we do it intentionally. I've done it. You've done it. We don't like to admit it because it's just another chink in our armor, but I think we've all been there. Can we, is it possible for us to put love 
uh, in such a way that we are not the ones who are provoking others. We call it getting a rise out of others. It, it may be funny at times, but is it really love? Sometimes the, the greatest decision we make each day is what our attitude will be. Will we put on love and kindness, or will we be and do the opposite? And finally, the last point that we look at this evening is the phrase of being resentful or keeping a record of wrongs. And this is a, a bookkeeping term, which means to count up, to take account of, as in a ledger. And the idea is, the thought is, is keeping score or the desire to settle the account. How many times, friends, have we kept a record of what people have done wrong? How many times? Sometimes we seem to harbor bitterness towards others as we, as we add up on a ledger page all that they've done wrong. Now, yes, we need to hold others accountable for their actions. And again, there is a, there's a fine line between holding others accountable and finding things we can use against someone. There are those very difficult balancing acts that we need to work through. When, when is it too much? I mean, too much. And it varies for everyone. It doesn't mean you aren't being kind and patient. Sometimes the greatest gift we can offer someone is tough love, love which seeks to help the other person grow and become more of the person Christ calls them to be. But it doesn't, um, it doesn't mean we throw out patience, kindness, gentleness, and grace. We try to demonstrate these virtues while, while loving the other person. I know this will not come as an as epiphany for us, but love is not always easy. It's just not. God's call in our lives is to love one another. Paul has given us some ideas on how to love. Ultimately, the call is for unity. And it's not always easy. And I think we're, we're learning that. I mean, so, sometimes maintaining unity involves a fight. It's not fun. M mistakes are made. People are hurt. Yet I want us to understand that the call of Christ is larger than any one person. Christ calls us to maintain the unity and to love one another. See, that'll always be the challenge. That'll always be the challenge within your life, within your church, and within the world. Love one another. May we always seek to love one another. As I mentioned Sunday, even when the storms of life come, because we know it's not a matter of if the storms will come, it's when the storms will come. You and I have to prepare ourselves. We have to be ready. We have to put on the armor of God to, to help us as we find ourselves in different storms of life. I have a, a list here of storms that people in our church and connected to our church are going through this week. Uh, I'm not at liberty to share all of them, and I'm not, not going to share any of them, really, um, other than to say, if you're watching and you're in one of those storms, we're praying for you. If you find yourself at this point in your life, when you're watching this, and hey, it's blue skies and everything looks great, know that your brothers and sisters are facing some storms in their life. And uh, the enemy, if he can distract us, if he can uh, c cause a wedge between us, um, that's really the only way he can get us is if he 
causes us to turn on each other. Scripture is so um, relevant to us, especially with this idea of love. Love being patient, love being kind. This is Wednesday. This is the midweek. So how have you done? If, 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 you're looked, if, you, if you're looking at this week, you're halfway through, how have you done in the area of patience and kindness? If you look back over the last few days and think, I've got some work to do, there's some great news. God is giving us opportunities today and tomorrow and the next day to work on this, to, to be reminded of this, to ask the Holy Spirit to help us. Lord, help us when we're confronted with situations to display patience and kindness. Patience and kindness. That's my goal to finish out this week, that whatever storm, whatever situation uh, may arise, that I may approach it from patience and kindness. That's my prayer for you as well. I want to pray for us tonight. I want to encourage you, finish the week strong, and may the Lord give you opportunities to practice patience and kindness. Lord, I thank you for uh, this time together. I thank you, Father, for um, being with us in the storms of life. I look at my list of those who are finding themselves in difficult situations and circumstances. And I pray, Father, that your grace, and your mercy, your compassion would be more than sufficient for their needs. I pray, Lord, for all of us that we would finish this week strong and that, Lord, patience and kindness would be a great descriptor of our love for others. Someone says something that, that hits us wrong, or if someone does something that uh, rubs us the wrong way, Father, remind us of this lesson tonight. Remind us of this passage. Remind us of the calling that you've given us, and that's to love others. We thank you, Father, for tonight and the ability to, to log on real quick on online and share a word of thought. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you, church. Can't wait to see you on Sunday. We'll be having church elections on Sunday. You have to be present in order to vote. I hope to see you then. God bless. We'll see you later. Bye.